Thank you, everyone. We're going to go ahead and call the meeting of the Bloomington City Council to order. If everyone will please stand for a Pledge of Allegiance and remain standing for a moment of silence. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Thank you. Councilmember Mathy? Here. Councilmember Bolin? Here. Councilmember Ibnawabwe? Here. Councilmember Emig? Present. Councilmember Painter? Here. Councilmember Carrillo? Here. Councilmember Black? Here. Councilmember Crable? Here. Councilmember Bray? Here. Mayor Renner? Here. Thank you very much. We have a quorum and we're going to go forward with recognitions and appointments. And this is certainly one of the uh, um, the happy moments and proud moments for us as elected officials and citizens of Bloomington, and that is we have a recognition of firefighters Michael McPherson and Bradley Meyer and Adam Johnson who have completed their one-year probation. And I am going to go ahead and turn it over to our chief, and please, uh, anyone who wants to come behind us on the stage, including uh, family, uh, friends, well-wishers, please come forward. I just want to say, do we feel safe or what? <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. So tonight I have the pleasure of recognizing three firefighters that completed their probationary period on January 7th of this year. So first we have Michael McPherson. You can stand up here. Uh, Michael was born in Bloomington to Joe and Julie McPherson. His family moved to Morris at a young age. He attended vocational fire school during high school. After graduating, he attended Joliet Junior College and earned his MTB. He then started working for the Morris Fire Department as an EMT and went through the Fire Academy. He earned his paramedic license through uh, Morris Hospital, and he was hired by Bloomington Fire Department on January 7th. And Mike, uh, do you have family members here that would stand up just to be recognized? Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> and next we have Bradley Meyer. And I'm going to let his uh, personality come out in this bio a little bit. So, <laughs> Brad is a locally grown, grown fella who comes from a farming background with a short career in professional baseball. He graduated from University High School in 2005. He's married to his wife, Lauren. He has three sons, Ivan, Jackson, and London. They live in McLean, which is where he originally joined the fire service as a volunteer in 2013. He received his paramedic training and became certified through McLean County Area EMS System a year and a half ago. He states he's very much looking forward to bringing his best he has to offer to BFD and the city of Bloomington. Brad Meyer. And Brad, do you have family members? Thank you. And then we have Adam Johnson. Adam was born and raised in Carmar Cam Camargo, Illinois. After high school, he received an associate's degree in fire science. He was honorably discharged from the United States Army after six years of service in the National Guard. He worked as a paramedic for the Pro Ambulance in Champaign prior to being hired by the City of Bloomington. He states that he's thankful to be given the opportunity to work along some of the finest firefighters on the job. Adam Johnson. And then your family. Raise your right hand. I, having been appointed to the Office of Firefighter in the City of Bloomington, in the County of McLean, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States 
shall support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of Illinois. And the Constitution of the State of Illinois. And faithfully discharge the duties of. And faithfully discharge the duties of. The office of firefighter. The office of firefighter. According to the best of my ability. According to the best of my ability. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you. Thanks for what you've done, and, and you're going to do. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for your work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for all your service. Thanks. Appreciate it. Congratulations. Thanks for your work. We have one last round of applause. Thank you so much for our first responder. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to go ahead and move along to uh, public comment. Public comment, everyone has up to three minutes. And for those of you who want to get direct answers and maybe engage with myself or perhaps other members of the administration, you know, I highly recommend that you come to our mayor's open house. I hold them uh, right over here at the fishbowl from 4.30 to 5.30 every Friday before a regular city council meeting. And that allows you to get some answers and perhaps uh, engage in dialogue. Our general policy, though, is uh, to not respond to, uh, to people who are speaking for up to three minutes in public comment. And so we have three people this evening, and I'm going to go ahead and read them uh, in the order. Scott Steinle, uh, Laura Bowie, and then uh, Olivia Butts. So we'll start out with Scott Steinle. Uh, I know that Jim gets uh, tired of me bringing this up, and uh, I would suggest that the city get out and fix the cotton pick and roads and raise the storm drains. Uh, you're going to end up having, with all that rain that we had, it came rushing down the road, plugged up that drain, and my drive was flooded. It was halfway up the drive, Terry. You know, maybe if it takes getting Jim Karsh out there or Tim Gleason or somebody like that, then maybe it needs to happen. You know, these roads are absolutely terrible. They are getting better, but why did it have to get to a crisis point before the council did anything? You know, there is absolutely no excuse for this, none. And I am embarrassed that the, con the infrastructure in this town is the way it is. Um, you know, I would strongly urge people to um, take a look at the way the streets are. Uh, another thing is the leaves are to be raked to the parkway, not in the street. There were times that they were raked on both sides of the street and that I had to stop 
because the other person wasn't going to stop and just pull over to the side and let them go. Now, that is a da that's dangerous to do that. I bet if they would get a citation once in a while, I bet it would stop. And, you know, I really don't care if they like it or not. Uh, do you think that I agree with everything the city of Bloomington does and everything Mr. Gleason does? No, I don't. Uh, do I think that uh, the city does anything about it? No, I don't. Would they do anything if somebody go 38 down to Wanda? You bet they would. Now, you know, there is absolutely no excuse. Just like you called Diane Benjamin a worthless piece of garbage, if you recall. And that's something you're probably not going to live down, Terry. Uh, I think I've made my point. Uh, Mr. Gleason needs to really stop and think, maybe I really need to do something else. But he goes back and hides. And, you know, it's not just him. It's everybody. You know, I've noticed once he came, you know, everything went to pot in a handbasket. And I know you're sitting up there thinking, boy, what's this guy? Shut up. You have a good night. Thank you. Next we go to uh, Laura and then Olivia. Okay, Laura Bowie, 601 Lutz Road. Your Honor, the Mayor Renner, City Manager Gleason, Assistant City Manager Tyus, and city council members. My husband Charles and I moved into Luther Oaks the first day that it was opened in 2007. Immediately, a question was, what can be done to improve Lutz Road, the only access to our new home? Over the years, we have joined our neighbors in advocating for upgrading Lutz Road, which is a city street. Charles and I have taken an active role addressing the Lutz Road question with current and past administrations and councils. And we are very grateful for the interest, encouragement, and support we have received. We're especially indebted to Public Works Director Jim Karch, Alderwoman Donna Bolin, and our past Ward 2 Councilman David Sage. From time to time, Charles and I have given a public comment concerning one of the iterations suggested as an answer to the Lutz Road question. In order to keep Lutz Road on your radar, we have become familiar faces here at the council, council meetings almost every meeting for eight years. Tonight, thanks to the outstanding work of City Manager Gleason, Assistant City Manager Tyus, plus other city staff and officials, along with our own Executive Director of Luther Oaks, Doug Rutter, and the administration of Lutheran Life Communities, a win-win proposal is being considered. The benefits and rationales for this proposal are eloquent, eloquently stated in the agenda packet. Charles and I would summarize the reasons to, to support this, uh, this proposal simply by saying it's for all the best reasons. We are so thankful that an answer to the Lutz Road question is on tonight's agenda and we ask that you please support, approve the Lutz Road project in agenda item 8A. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Olivia? Hi all, I'm here today to express my concern and total disappointment um, in your inaction to extend public comment during the December 16th meeting. Um, and then the vote um, about cannabis here in Bloomington. As you know, I served on the Cannabis Task Force, and not only that, but I give my time to a variety of organizations locally that I believe uphold my own personal values. It's extremely important to me, as it should be to you, that our local politicians, legislators, and council people are not only listening to the opinions of the public, but then are also ac held accountable for their actions. On November 12th, a group of people came to the Bloomington City Council to speak out on climate action um, during public comment, if you remember that. Um, I applaud that organization and their commitment to the cause. Uh, Kim Bray, as, as public comment time expired on that date, you, and I quote, said, I would like to make a motion to extend public comment for 20 more minutes to accommodate the citizens who have come here today to speak to us. Every single one of you voted in, 
in favor to extend time on November 12th. It was unanimous. Then we look at the December 16th meeting, which I would argue is more vital time to get public opinion, as you were taking a vote that night on cannabis legislation, an issue that was directly addressed in nearly every single public comment that evening. So I would ask you, Donna Bolin, Mboka Mwambwe, Johnny Painter, Scott Black, and Kim Bray, why you would vote to extend time during one meeting and not the other. And then obviously even Kim Bray, you made the motion that night um, during the November 12th meeting. Is there any reason you could possibly give for the total difference in approach between the two meetings, um, outside of some of the already established biases that we've seen? Of all people, you folks sitting up here um, should be the most interested in getting people involved in local government. Any chance you get, you should be advocating for more thoughts and opinions from your constituents. You should be excited when this room is full, when it is packed. It doesn't happen very often, as you know, and as I know, I've come to a, quite a variety of meetings with as little as five people here and as, as many as 100. Um, I know the people at the December 16th, I know people at the December 16th meeting who were planning on speaking for the first time, um, had written out their public comments in advance, made changes, practiced speaking, and then came early to put their name in that comment box. Many of those folks were doing that for the first time, which may, I know you've been to quite a few of these meetings, but can be a little nerve-wracking for people. Um, I believe you're not allowing to speak goes against the values that you, as representatives of the people, are expected to uphold, which is why I'm here tonight to just ask you to consider um, that you extend public comment the same for certain issues as well as other issues. I hope that you think about that. Um, I think, hope you think about what it means when you decide to extend for some folks and some causes and not for others. Thanks. Thank you very much. <clears throat> We move right along to our consent agenda. Are there any items that any member of the city council would like to uh, have pulled from the consent agenda for separate consideration? Councilwoman Bowles. Yes, 7G. 7G. Any other items to be removed from the consent agenda? Seeing none, uh, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented with the exception of item 7G? So moved. Second. Moved by Council Member Boland, and then second by Council Member Craybill. Any further discussion? Okay, if everyone will go ahead and uh, vote. Okay. Motion carries 9 to 0. There are no nays to announce, Madam Clerk, and I'm going to turn this over to uh, Council Member Boland, who pulled item 7G. Uh, yes, this is uh, <laughs> about a change in zoning for Southgate Parcel, and the reason I pulled it, I'm very much in favor of it. It is located in Ward 2. Um, the property owner, out of courtesy, reached out to me, and he gave me a tour of the property. He showed me his plans for the property. It is going to be duplexes set on foundations with attached garages, um, affordable housing, and it is on the heels of the development of the VA clinic, and his hope is that um, members of, of our community that are veterans would take advantage of that because it would be within walking distance to the clinic. Um, and I'm really very excited about it. Um, it adds value to our community. Thank you. Oh, and I make a motion to pass. Okay. <laughs> is there a second to the motion to approve? Uh, second by Councilmember Emig and uh, at least a couple others. If everyone will go ahead and vote, we have a motion and a second. Motion carries 9 to 0. There are no nays to announce, Madam Clerk. And uh, we move right along then to our regular agenda, electronic, uh, excuse me, electronic roll call. Uh, 8A, consideration and action on an agreement between the City of Bloomington and Luther Oaks. We've heard about that. And... Uh, Many uh, of us have been dealing with this, well, certainly well over six and a half years. I've been mayor for six, a little over six and a half years, almost seven years, and it's been an issue for, uh, for a very long time and even before then. So uh, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Mr. Gleason, who has a brief presentation, and we have a brief council discussion. Mr. Gleason. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, this was an item when uh, I stepped in a year and a half ago now uh, that uh, it was pretty clear that the direction was to get this finished. And um, very similar to the public comments that we heard uh, earlier this evening, 
this has had many different iterations over the course of several years. But uh, Deputy City Manager Tyus, who's going to have a couple of comments about this and take any questions, uh, he was asked to uh, start from scratch with this. Uh, so this is uh, his work product uh, that's before Council for uh, consideration tonight. Billy. Thank you, uh, Mayor and members of Council. Um, the manager, one of the things that he did early on was, and he was diplomatic here, was to say, figure out a way, if there is a way, to do this. And so he, he did, he said, start from scratch and just to see if there were, were possibilities here. Uh, make no promises, and we have not, um, but to see if there was a way to come to an agreement. Um, there are a lot of folks who have worked on this, our legal department, several members of our public works department as well have worked on this. Um, as the manager said, there's been lots of discussion over the years but it's something that was clearly contemplated as far back as the year 2000 because this was included in the annexation agreement um, with the property owners. Um, again, one of the things that may be different and that's really driving our conversation tonight was, is the development opportunity. Um, one of the things that we found out early on was that uh, the Luther Oaks team was interested in expanding, but they couldn't see really the feasibility of pursuing that if there weren't going to be plans for, for road improvements there. And again, that wasn't in a negative way. It was simply a statement of where they stood. Um, as part of this agreement, if approved by you, uh, the city would agree to make road improvements up front, and Luther Oaks, would, within the next five years, would agree to make a minimum of $1.5 million in investment in their campus. Um, if those improvements are not made, there's a clawback provision here, and I'll call it that, um, that says that the, the city could either require the funds to be repaid or the improvements to be made. Um, Luther Oaks has a track record of, of, of expansion and of renovation on a campus as well. So we don't see that coming, um, but it's nice to be there. Um, the other thing is that it's not uncommon for municipalities to make infrastructure improvements as an incentive for development. It happens across the country. And so this is in line with what has been done both here and in other cities as well. And finally, I know a number of you have asked about the, the tax implications. Um, we know that there, there's church involvement in the site, and there was questions about whether or not there are taxes paid. Um, yes, there are, and the general rule of thumb for estimating is that um, you add about a third of the project value to the overall taxable value. So what that means in layman's terms is that when a property is taxed, it's based on an assessed value, and say, for instance, someone is making a $1.5 million investment you don't add all of that to the taxable value, you estimate about a third of that. And so there would be an increase in property taxes paid as part of this project if this is improved, is, is approved, excuse me. Um, be happy to take any questions. I do know that Doug Rutter is here, uh, the executive director of Luther Oaks. And again, um, happy to answer any questions if we can. Questions to Mr. Tyus. Comments, uh, 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 Council Member Black. <clears throat> Thank you guys for finding a way to bring this before us. Is it? Oh, okay. <laughs> Council Member Cadillo. We'll, 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 we'll go ahead okay. and go this way. Um, so I'm not sure that this matters because I think that the, the support uh, is here for this proposal. Um, but I do feel like I have to lend my voice to uh, what will probably be an unpopular opinion in this room. So I'm bracing for the tomatoes. I'm ready. Um, but uh, while I'm super sympathetic to the concerns that Luther Oaks residents have raised, um, and please don't think that it's because I don't care about this issue. Um, I just am not sure how we ended up landing on this particular solution, uh, and I'm not super satisfied with this proposal. Um, I guess one question uh, for, for Assistant City Manager Tyus is, um, was there ever an offer from the folks at the Luther Oaks facility to split the cost of, of the road? I guess uh, my question and the question that I got from a number of constituents is, um, if there is, $1.5 million to be made in terms of improvements to the Luther Oaks facility. Um, was there ever an offer that that money be put towards um, helping the city deal with the, the cost of the road? It is one of the things that we actually talked about earlier on in this discussion. And as a lot of you know, uh, there in past iterations of this, there were discussions about um, the Luther Oaks group uh, contributing to this project. Um, since that time, um, there's been changes in leadership there. Um, there's been a change in the executive director, a change in the president of the company that owns Luther Oaks as well, and it wasn't something that was feasible or possible at this time. 
Um, again, one of the other things that we, not again, one of the other things we talked about in line with what you, you've talked about is we also didn't want there to appear to be any appearance of someone being able to pay and then move a project forward. We were re very conscious of, conscious of that as well. It's one thing that the manager actually talked about was we wanted to avoid that as best we could. Sure. Um, and then I think uh, if you could clarify this for me, um, it, to me in, in the packet, the agreement that is there like talks about an expansion of Luther Oaks, right? But um, I guess my reading of it was that there, there is no real like in writing commitment to add living units, right? So if all that the Luther Oaks folks did was um, improve common areas and, and invest $1.5 million into the facility to make improvements, um, that they would still be within the bounds of, of the agreement that's in the packet. Is that correct? It is correct that they, there is no requirement in the agreement that they expand the number of living units. That is absolutely correct. One of the things that's a part of their financing is that they cannot agree to do to expand their campus as it relates to living units without the the permission of, of the bondholders and so that was not something that while they expect that that will happen um, it's not something that they could commit to because they would have to ask permission the other thing is that in terms of the 1.5 million dollar investment they will have to come forward to us and show us what it is that they're proposing to do and actually show us invoices as it relates to the investment and so while, it's, while this agreement doesn't state you will add this number of units or that you will add this number of square feet of space, it does require a commitment of a certain dollar amount for certain types of, of, of renovations and expansions. So I think, yeah, I just, you know, I, I'm not going to be supportive of the proposal. Um, even though I totally am, am sympathetic to the concerns, I hear them and I want to see them be resolved. I'm just not quite sure that this is the way that we um, resolve them just because um, I'm going to have a really hard time justifying to folks who live um, in parts of the city where there has not been significant uh, investments made in infrastructure, um, why we are going to spend close to a million dollars um, to serve a population that is, you know, relatively narrow. Um, and so, uh, but, you know, wanted to just name that it's not because I don't think that what you all uh, are experiencing is real and, and matters. I just am not sure that, um, that this proposal uh, gets it for me. Thank you very much. Uh, Council Member Bowling. I move to accept as presented. Um, there's already been, well, first of all, this is a vertical neighborhood. There's 200 units in that neighborhood. There's 24-7, 365 coverage by profess medical professionals that have to use that road every day. $60,000 already has been put into um, engineering study. Staff time over the past eight years has been put in to resolve this issue. The, hi the council has already approved the hybrid mechanism or hybrid design that's going to go in. And it provide service to Wittenberg Wood subdivision also, as well as access to the new park that we approved just a couple months ago. Um, there are 150 jobs in that community, and vendors provide uh, resources to that community. There is a lot of economic impact in that community whether someone recognizes that or not, if you study the history, and if you know about economics and how it works, I think you would think that this is a great idea. Thank you. Is there a second to that motion? I'll I'll second the motion. A uh, second by several people. Uh, um, I did hear uh, Council Member Bray first. Uh, at, at this point, in terms of the order in which I've seen the names, uh, Council Member Crable and then Massey and um, Oh, you didn't have your slide light on. Okay, Council Member Crable and Matthew. Oh, and then Emig. Excuse me. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Um, so uh, I don't really have questions, just comments, because Billy, mm -hmm. you answered all my questions uh, over the uh, last couple of days, uh, and Donna also assisted me with understanding uh, the issue. Um, and, and I just want to, you know, add to what Scott said. You know, thank you everyone for coming to a solution that's, you know, it's an issue that's festered for 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 many years. 
Um, I, I agree, there's a lot of roads that need improved uh, in Bloomington that are a lot older than, than Lutz Road. Uh, but I mean, um, uh, my, uh, my, I took my daughter, she's, um, she's getting her learner's permit, so I have to get her hours in, so I made her go with me uh, down to uh, Lutz Road. And she said um, it was bumpy and skinny, so. <laughs> <laughs> It, it, so, I mean, it, it's not just a road that has to be repaved, right? This is something that needs to be totally, it's substandard. Um, uh, and, and also, you, you told me that, you know, we've got $5.8 million uh, in road improvements this year, in, in addition to what's going to happen with Lutz Road. Um, and, and like Donna said, a prior council approved the building of Luther Oaks development, and I think once that approval goes in, you've got to, May give them a road that that is functional, um, you know. So I will be voting in favor uh, of, of this. Thank you, Councilmember Matthew, and then uh, Emig and Bolin. Thank you, uh, Billy. Thank you for addressing one critical component of this. That um, there have been um, proposals in the past where Luther Oaks might share in the cost of rebuilding that road, and I would have strenuously objected and campaigned against that. Um, I don't think that we should ever be put in a position as a city where um, the perception of somebody with money can buy their way to the front of their line. We have, we know we have a lot of work to do um, and we know that we have a lot of different neighborhoods, um, but I don't want to be ever put in a place where um, a neighborhood or a business or anybody who can, with access to capital, can buy their way to the front of the line um, in front of some of the older neighborhoods where the property values might not be as high or people might not have that same access to capital. And so um, I appreciate that this came with uh, an economic condition um, uh, agreement as part of it as opposed to accepting any sort of uh, a, a money like that because I think it, that would have opened this up to so many possibilities where things could have gone sideways that it I just don't even want to contemplate that. So thank you for all your work on this, and I really appreciate the way this got structured. Thank you. Council Member Emig and then Bolin. Yeah, I'll, I'll reiterate the oh. thanks, yeah. and I appreciate um, everyone who responded to my questions as well. Um, I'm also voting in favor of, of this um, proposition. The road is failing and unsuitable. A promise was made years ago, investment. Um, there is an investment in expansion, and I believe that there will be more opportunity for public events and whatnot at this site. Um, at the same time, I agree that we cannot abdicate our um, responsibility to repair infrastructure citywide. I don't think they're mutually exclusive, and um, I maintain that we can pri prioritize the need to improve facilities for our growing elderly population um, as a gateway to potential economic expansion and development and that at the same time we need to be mindful of the entire city and the needs of all. Thank you. Technically we've run out of uh, time, but I'm going to, as long as we're all it's reasonably short. expeditious, it's, it's, I will, I'll, I'll broadly interpret that. Uh, Council Member Boland. I appreciate your persistence. <laughs> um, and the reason is, is because it benefits your neighbors in Wittenberg Wood and it also um, benefits future generations. This road should last 20 years or more. So I appreciate your advocacy for the future. Thank you. Councilmember Peter. Thank you, and thank you for doing all this hard work to bring this baby home finally. I mean, ever <laughs> since I've been on council, we've been talking about Lutz Road, and I remember Chief Kimmerling saying how difficult it was to get emergency vehicles around that whole area when he was here. And these people have been patient, they've been persistent, and they've been very polite. And I am really glad that this is finally happening and I'm going to be voting in support of this. Thank you. Councilmember Black. Thank you. Um, just really quickly, uh, in the past I have uh, voted against uh, these types of, of things because I thought that it was a not the best use of our priorities or funds. Um, and this, this case is a little bit different. And so Jim brought up the point of, you know, how do you go back and talk to people and um, just share what I've, my conversations have been is that this is the type of growth that I like to see, which is infill. 
Um, we're not sprawling. Um, we are taking existing property and developing it. Um, this is part of a 12-plus year process of uh, from the planning commission through council through many iterations. I remember when I first got on, I took a ride out uh, uh, over there, and uh, I was surprised at how narrow the streets were. I've been over there a couple different times, talked with the residents. and. and one of the things I try to think about when doing this role is, is how can I put head to pillow at night? And I, emergency vehicles at, at a retirement community, that's something that I want to make sure that we can take care of. Um, so there's always going to be competing priorities, different streets that we can be focused on. Um, but with the economic development in an infill type capacity, this is something that I really support. And, and so um, I understand um, those that, that would like to see us use this money elsewhere. Um, but this isn't a, you know, a stoplight far away. This is a, uh, a, key pro uh, a key area doing infill along with economic development. So I'm very excited to be supporting this evening. Okay. Seeing no one else uh, lights on, if everyone will go ahead and vote on the motion as presented, please. Motion carries eight to one. There's one NATO announce, Madam Clerk. Councilmember Carrillo. Okay. We move right along then to our city manager's discussion. Mr. Gleason. Thank you, Mayor and Council. <coughs> uh, Happy New Year to everyone. And we have the uh, slide with the upcoming events. Uh, one that I'm going to highlight that I'm going to guess, Alderman Matthew might as well, is the... Uh, second annual uh, eSports uh, event, bless you. And uh, that starts this Friday, and then uh, I think caps off uh, with the championship on Sunday, uh, the 19th. Uh, but there's other events that are going on uh, as well. I'm going to move on. Uh, the mayor has uh, authorized a uh, special uh, meeting for a legislative update with our state elected officials, and that's going to be on February 1st, which is a Saturday morning. Uh, I think the tentative start time, and it will be published, uh, will be at 9 a.m. on uh, Saturday, uh, February 1st. And, and we've done these in the past. Uh, our state elected are Senator Bill Brady, uh, Senator Jason Berrickman, and then we have representatives, uh, Keith Summer and Dan Brady, all of our SBP'd that they'll uh, be in attendance. Uh, but we've done these in the past, I believe in April or May. A legis uh, legislative session has already uh, started. So while there will be a couple of days into this session, uh, the last week of January, it's perfect timing. So that's going to occur. I know you guys are aware of it, sharing that with the uh, community. And then finally, to uh, close the loop on a request that goes back to uh, October to have uh, our representative on the Connect Transit uh, Working Group. Uh, originally, it was slated for a commi committee the whole presentation in November. Uh, that person has been dealing with uh, some health challenges. So November and December, we did not have a committee the whole. Uh, so we had had something uh, tentatively scheduled for uh, January to close the loop. But Mike McCurdy, the chairman of the board, made the request that uh, we postpone that since the working groups are about four or six weeks away from uh, completing their work. So a uh, complete uh, presentation will be done at that time. And that's all I've got. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I just wanted to uh, say as part of the mayor's uh, and it's not so much of a discussion, just a uh, happy new year to everyone and yours, and we certainly hope that we can make uh, even more progress and move further in our entire community in the next year and than we have in the past. Uh, we always want to keep building on our successes. I'd also like to uh, make an announcement. We have two Martin Luther King events that are coming up on Saturday at 1 o'clock at ISU. There's a Martin Luther King dinner, and that's uh, at uh, of 1 p.m., and that's January 18th, and there's also the uh, Martin Luther King Gospel Fest at Illinois Wesleyan University at Presser Hall, and that starts at 5 p.m. on Monday, January 20th, and that's a week from today. We will not be having our city council meeting a week from today. It'll be the day after, and I think I would certainly uh, urge everyone to do that. It's the 91st birthday of uh, Martin Luther King. Um, but he died, and of course, was assassinated 52 years ago. He was only on the earth 39 years, but certainly led a major uh, second reconstruction, uh, which was the successful one in America. Our first reconstruction was a failure, largely because of the Supreme Court. And we had a civil rights movement that really pushed us forward toward 
making a, a perfect union. And that's what we're always trying to do in America, is to try to make a more perfect union so truly all human beings can be considered equal. And so I would urge you to uh, celebrate and commemorate uh, Mr. King, uh, Dr. King's uh, movement, his contributions, and the progress that has made in America. So um, that's all I have. And we'll start with, uh, we'll go around this way, uh, Councilmember Carrillo, and then Bolin and Matthew. Yeah, thanks for shouting out the MLK events. I won't be able to attend, so I just want to shout out uh, the winners of the MLK Junior Award for 2020, um, who are former Bloomington Council member Karen Schmidt, uh, Elaine Hill of Normal, uh, Youth Award winner Kaylin Richards of Bloomington, and Youth Award winner uh, Drove Reba uh, of Normal. Uh, so congratulations to those folks. Uh, you all should be honored, and I'm sorry I can't join you uh, on Saturday, but I'm sure you all will represent well. Um, and, and then uh, February 7th is First Friday, and it's Tour de Chocolat, so um, that is the one that you really, really don't want to miss. Um, so please uh, come out and join us. Brave the cold. It hasn't been that bad, um, and the last one was a lot of fun, so I uh, encourage folks to join us. Um, then the folks at the McLean County Museum of History are following up on uh, their awesome new permanent exhibit around uh, uh, politics and tensions and power in our community uh, with a series of community conversations. Uh, I'm going to be moderating some of them in like small groups and I'm sure like some of you have gotten invited and hit up to do that so it will be a whole bunch of community members uh, helping to organize the sessions and also participating. Um, each one has a theme, but the dates are January 28th for the first one, February 27th for the second, uh, March 21st, uh, and then uh, April 28th. Um, and you can check it out on Facebook. So each one, uh, each event has a description of what the conversation that day um, will be, but they are all equally riveting, so please check them out. And then the last thing is that um, taking a page off of the mayor, um, I started organizing these things that I'm calling community council meetings. Um, they are, you know, they were originally thought of designed for Ward 6 residents, but people uh, from all the wards are welcome to come. Uh, and I'm doing these monthly on the second Thursday of the month uh, at rotating locations. Um, and so you can check that out on my Facebook page, but also uh, open to collaborate with any of you folks on the council if you ever want to um, hold one here or in some other space. Uh, the more people are on the table, the better. And Happy New Year. Thank you. Councilmember Boland and Matthew. <clears throat> um, I just want to say that I spent Friday at, I'm going to have to read all of this, uh, Women's Justice Institute Mapping Session. It was hosted by Judge Foley. And I'm going to read from the handout that was passed out because I think it's very poignant. Um, the Women's Justice Institute work is anchored by the voices of impacted women and girls and advanced by a broad, deep partnership with diverse justice system stakeholders. Using a variety of tools and strategies, the Women's Justice Institute builds transformative interventions centered on strengths of women and the role they play throughout communities. Our work is focused on decarceration, harm reduction, system transformation that leads to improved well-being and outcomes among women, children, and communities. The session is the first step in a long-term strategy to build our community's capacity to effectively meet the complex and intersecting needs of women, including implementation of gender-responsive, trauma-informed, and family-centered policies, practices, and programs and the creation of a dynamic interagency collaboration. Um, there were about 60 participants there from all members of, the, of all areas of the community, um, lawyers, and of course Judge Foley was there, the police chiefs, our own Dan, um, and the sheriff was there, elected officials from the county, and myself. Um, there were just about every social um, entity, social service entity was there. But what impressed me the most and, and had the biggest impact on me was the incarcerated women, or the for they were formerly incarcerated, and they shared their stories and, uh, and, fr and frustrations. And then they also added their solutions. 
and I thought it was just very powerful. And this is going to continue, and I think it's in conjunction with the McLean County Mental Health Initiative. So I'm excited. Thank That's you very it. much. Councilmember Matthew. So to talk about something else completely for a second, um, uh, I would be remiss if, as a former member of the Cultural Commission, if I didn't point out that there is a ton of really awesome shows that are coming up at the BCPA. Um, I've got tickets to several of them, including Bandstand, which won a Tony Award for several Tony Awards. Um, so if you haven't looked at the BCPA calendar events coming up, I would suggest taking a look because um, we've got stuff that you can get tickets to here in Bloomington for like $30 that if you went to Chicago, the exact same show leaves here and goes there, and then you have to pay $100 to go see it. So um, we've seen that multiple times. I'd check out that calendar with some awesome stuff coming up. Uh, also, um, the eSports event is this weekend. Thank you, Tim. Um, there's, we've got 35 teams coming in. Uh, the majority of them are from outside of McLean County with about a third of them from outside of Illinois traveling here to compete um, in both an open division as well as a high school only division. Um, so we've got that going on. That starts on Friday. The actual Bloomington Normal Video Game Tournament uh, Convention starts on Saturday and tickets are still available and um, you can come in and there's a ton of activities going on, including Billy Mitchell trying to set a new record for uh, Donkey Kong high score. So uh, <laughs> some games never die and uh, that'll be exciting as well. There's also an ISU game jam. So there's a bunch of ISU and other college kids that are participating in a programming event where they're going to actually try to create a, a video game in 24 hours. And then on top of that, there's an entire session of uh, speakers on starting esports teams and how to get esports teams up and running in your schools and, and for parents, too, who are hearing that their kids could actually go to college by playing video games. So uh, this, I, I don't know where this was 20 years ago when I needed it, or <laughs> maybe realistically 30 years ago. But, um, you know, it, it should be a great weekend and bring a ton of people downtown. And... Uh, again, we're still shooting for this to be in uh, IHSA state championships here in Bloomington and not in some other city in Illinois. So, Did Thank I hear you, you right that uh, Billy Mitchell's coming to town? Yes. Interesting. With his own level of controversy all about I was going to say, him. don't watch the King of Kong before you, uh, yeah. you meet him. So. He, he, he's a controversial figure um, with his ongoing fights with the Guinness Book of World Records. But, uh, Twin galaxies and such. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So. And if anybody uh, knows who he is, make sure that you show up. That's a full blown And drop money in the city of Bloomington while you're doing it. Yeah, it's it's for all ages too, like kids starting seven years old and up. It'll be it'll be fun for everybody. Thank you so much. At this point, there's a motion to adjourn. So moved. Uh, well. <laughs> okay, we uh, moved by Councilmember Carrillo, second by Councilmember uh, Painter. All in favor, signify by saying aye. We're adjourned. Thank you so much.